conversation um, and more of a, a, a kind of um, informative reflection, I think, on what Willa Cather means to the state um, beyond the you know, congressional book reports that we just heard um, in, in, the, in, the, in the nicest way possible. Um, but I think, I think the thing, you know, to really begin this, and I think the reminder that we all, you know, we, we, we take certainly in Nebraska, I think we take Willa Cather for granted. Um, we all maybe at some point were, were forced to read O Pioneers or My Antonia in high school, uh, maybe some of the short stories, maybe, maybe some of her poems if you were lucky. Um, and really Cather in Nebraska is, is an effort that is maintained and, and is a legacy that is, uh, you know, disseminated by, by multiple agencies and, and people. And I'm really, really happy that we have many of those individuals in the room here. And so from the National Willa Cather Center, we have Tracy Tucker and Rachel Olson, um, the Director of Education and, and the Archivist. Um, the National Willa Cather Center, History Nebraska, where we are presently, and, and Willa's alma mater, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, are, are really kind of the leading lights in really disseminating and sharing information, images, photos, letters, um, artifacts, and a lot of important developments are happening this year as we celebrate her 150th birthday, um, as well as the centennial of the publication of A Lost Lady and her final collection of poetry, um, April Twilights and Other Poems. Um, but she really is someone who, again, we take her for granted. We don't understand that she is a global phenomenon, right? Again, we have, we have had to read her in high school, or maybe you have gone to Red Cloud. Um, maybe, maybe you haven't, and you should. Um, maybe you haven't read her in a while, and there's certainly copies of her uh, books in the bookstore here. You can go to a novel idea around the corner, or if you've got a library card, the Public Library and the Love Library are both within walking distance, so I highly recommend you do that. So we're going to have a conversation today on, on what she means to Nebraska, this legacy, and, and maybe a little bit of appreciation um, for her. And, and really, I want to kind of focus on, on Cather as a Nebraskan. And she really is, you know, she's, she's born in Virginia through no fault of her own, um, <laughs> but, but does come to Nebraska um, very, very early in her life. And she really sets this stage for us on what it means to be a Nebraskan, the particularities of Nebraska and the world that we get in. And I'm, I'm very happy to say that none of the quotes that anybody else read, I think, are in this talk. So you're going to get a broader uh, insight, I think, into her, her body of scholarship and her, and her writing. And this is, this is the world that she is in. This is Red Cloud. Um, this is an image, actually, that, that is, is from the collection here at History Nebraska. Um, over, it's in the Webster County collection, I believe, over in the archive. Um, and this is the, the, the depot in Red Cloud, still there, still, still owned by the National Willow Cather Center, no longer on the railroad tracks. But this is the town that she arrived in. This is the town, as we, as we saw from the selection from my Antonia, that, that Jim Burden, that, that Willa arrives in from Virginia. And she gives us another return to this space um, in, in the opening of My Antonia, and it's really, it's, this, is, this encompasses a lot of what I think about Willa Cather, is this very, very short quote, is Jim Burden's on the train and, and, and meets Willa, and un, uh, unnamed, but it's Willa. Um, and we agreed that no one who had not grown up in a little prairie town could know anything about it. It was a kind of Freemasonry, we said. It's a secret society. Small town Nebraska is a secret society. But what Willa does is she gives us the handshake. She, she gives us the keys into that secret society. So I don't want to age anyone in this room, but none of us grew up in late 19th century Nebraska. Um, none of us know that world firsthand. Yet nevertheless, we know her stories, and we know her red cloud, and we know her town, okay? because she invites us in. This is one of the many complexities about her, of both being provincial and yet cosmopolitan, as, as for, and I know some of you were there um, at the Willa Cather conference this last, last uh, week that, that Ashley Olson, the director, um, kind of discussed at the beginning of the conference. She is um, complex, she is difficult, and as, as we saw today, she certainly loves Nebraska, but she is also Nebraska's harshest critic. And she will, she will tell you what she thinks about small town life. And she will tell you what she thinks about folks in small towns. And this is what captivates us about her work. It's this embeddedness within the landscape and the people. The space, the place, and the people 
of Nebraska. This is why we all feel like we know her. This is why you can go to Red Cloud and you can go to the spaces that she inhabited. You can go to her childhood home, although not right now, it's on the back of a truck. Um, you can go to the Opera House where she graduated, where she performed. You can go to the cemetery and you can see many of the people who populated her novels. You can visit these places. You can see these spaces. You can go to the prairie. And so she is, you know, a place that, that is, is foreign to us. The past is a foreign country. We, we don't know. Red Cloud today is not Red Cloud of the 1880s or the 1890s. Yet she invites us into it and brings us into it. We find in it her world, and, and, and as a result, we find ours. And so she's at once provincial and, and cosmopolitan, as is, is actually said at the conference. Um, and it's in her journalism, her short stories, her poems, and her novels, as well as her essays. I highly recommend you read um, Nebraska at the end of the first cycle. She has a lot to say about the state. Um, she really doesn't like the changes that are happening at the university. She doesn't like football. There's all sorts of stuff um, in there. I don't actually think the football stuff's not in that essay. It's somewhere else. But, um, you know, just briefly on the biography, and, and it's alluded to at various points in time. You know, she, she's born in, in Virginia in 1883. And, and many of you certainly saw in the news recently the efforts to preserve her, her childhood home um, outside Winchester. Um, but she, she's born in, or excuse me, she's born in, in um, Virginia in, in 1873, but, but comes as a, as a nine-year-old girl with, with the rest of the Virginians, as they're announced in the paper, who are coming to uh, the Divide, which is, which is northwest of, of Red Cloud. Um, and she was nine, and, and, and this transformation proved transformative. She would later say that you know, all, all of the stuff of, of her, her body of work you know, is, is built on memories from her childhood. Um, it's this early period. She had everything she needed to be a novelist by the time she was very, very young. Um, she attends the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, just over the road in 1895, um, and, and very quickly kind of makes a splash in the local community. She very, very quickly gets a job. She's the music, she's the theater critic, she's the opera critic, um, she's the music critic for um, the Nebraska State Journal. Um, and publishes significantly um, in, in this early time period and is really known about town. Um, she befriends, there, there's a really you know, kind of invigorating group of people at the university at this time period. Um, others who also have buildings on campus named after them, like Louise Pound, Pound Hall, well, as well as her brother Roscoe. Um, Dorothy Canfield Fisher, who's actually uh, a middle schooler at the time, um, and would become um, a, a, an author of her own renown, and she, she's the daughter of the, the chancellor at the university at the time. Um, she lives in New York, though, for, for most of her adult life. She, she spends some time in Pittsburgh, um, is, is a high school teacher, also, also doing work um, for, the, for the Home Monthly, for, for a, a kind of short-lived um, magazine, but, but spends the vast majority of her life in New York City. And, and for, for that time, for, for 39 of those years, she is living with Edith Lewis, her, her, her partner. Um, Edith is also from Nebraska. She's from Lincoln. Um, she's, she's from here. She does spend some time, I do have to say, she does spend part of her childhood in Kearney, but she is from Lincoln. Um, she graduates from high school here in Lincoln, but, but attends Smith College. Um, and the pair of them travel the world. They, they spend time in France. They spend time, Edith spend time in, in Italy. Um, they are really um, inseparable figures. They build a cabin together in Canada, and, and they remain together today. They are both buried in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, right next to one another. Um, in 1923, she is, 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 is mentioned, she is awarded the Pulitzer Prize uh, for one of ours, for her World War I novel, um, which, which is not, certainly not um, you know, high in, in the larger body of her works, but is a, a, a sound recognition for um, her effort and, and her labor and her artistic talent. It'll, it's also a commemoration of her, her cousin, G.P. Cather, who dies on the front in the uh, First World War. And in 1947, as already mentioned, she does pass away from cancer and is buried in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. So Willa Cather is not in Nebraska today. You have to go to small town New Hampshire to find Willa Cather. But you wouldn't necessarily know that by, by what we have of Willa Cather's world. And, and again, much of her world remains with us in various forms. This is the childhood home, um, as it appeared um, some time ago before uh, uh, kind of a, uh, an initial restoration. It was a series of apartments. Um, and and uh, Catherine Minor Sherwood, um, Will Cather's best friend in Red Cloud, actually walked 
Mildred Bennett through um, the house and kind of pointed out where things were and they were able to restore it and is now undergoing another substantial um, restoration effort. And in particular, if you've ever had the opportunity, and if you haven't, you really need to, um, you can go upstairs and you can see her room and you can see the wallpaper that she hung still on the wall of her room where she put it after she got it. Um, and this world that, that she brings us, this red cloud, here we have on Main Street, and, and actually you can see the National Willow Cather Center occupying much of that block today. The world, her Nebraska, this red cloud, is much like our Nebraska, is that it's, it's really a flawed landscape. It's, it's by far no means utopian. Um, you know, we, we have, as, as, as we saw, a lot of fawning images of the pioneers, but, but it's also brutal images. Um, if anyone remembers in my Antonia the, the discussion of, of the Russian sled and the wolves, or the hobo who goes through the thresher in front of Antonia. Okay, in Song of the Lark, a hobo drowns and gives the whole town typhoid in, in the um, town water tower. Um, kind of the, the, the crux of, of O Pioneers is a murder and infidelity. Um, so there's a lot that, that is in here. And, and so rather um, than a utopian kind of nostalgic, nostalgic image of the prairie, she really wants us to understand that Nebraskans, Nebraska is tragically human. She sees us for, for who we are, and she, she understands that. Um, you know, her spaces are driven by family, by love, by bitterness, by vanity, greed. Um, these, these, are, these are novels that do depict the brutalities of the pioneer experience or the reality of, of 19th century New Mexico or, or colonial Quebec um, or, or even um, Civil War era Virginia if, if you go through the, the totality of her canon. Um, but it's, it's, it's a recognition, but it's also a uh, understanding that, that nevertheless, this is, this is where she's from. This is, this is what she calls home. Um, that she can see it, and she can understand it, and she can love it, and she can criticize it, um, and she can love these flawed people. And she actually writes, and this is, this is an appropriate short story, is the sculptor's funeral for the commemoration that we were having today. And it, it's about a sculptor who does, who dies. He comes back in a casket, given, uh, brought back by a young student. Um, and that his best friend at home, and, and it's, it's the, the debates and the anxieties and, and ultimately the kind of the confrontation that happens as the town folk kind of swarm around and start gossiping about him and everything that goes on. But, but the dying sculptor does have some thoughts on this, and he says, it seems as though we ought to go back to the place we came from in the end. The townspeople will come in for a look at me, and after they've had their say, I shan't have much to fear from the judgment of God. <laughs> That's, that's, that's a biting critique of small town life, but it's also done with love. Like, I'm gonna come back and they're gonna say some awful things about me, but I nevertheless wanna go back home. And in showing us in this Nebraska, you know, the images of Willa that, that survive are just, you know, really incredible. She asks us to see the state and the people as we are. Not as we wanna be, not as we hope we are, but as we are. This is the thread for those of you, and again, it's the centennial who have read A Lost Lady. This is, this is one of the tensions at the, at the heart of The Lost Lady, is seeing people as they are, not how we imagine them to be. And if you haven't read it, you should. It's, it's the inspiration in part for Great Gatsby. Um, very, very, and it also has a lot to say about the third governor of the state of Nebraska, Silas Garber, um, for whom it's, it's partially modeled on. And we know this, she, she documents in her time here, this is Willa at center on, on a bicycle. Um, she asks us, you know, she documents, as has already been noted, she documents the immigrants, the homesteaders, the bankers, the opera singers, the domestic workers, the artists, the mothers, the rich, the poor, the alcoholics, the town eccentrics, and village rebels. Um, very much, you know, someone who Willa was. Here we have her on campus, just up the street, Old Main behind. And this is actually, this is her commencement program from 1895. Not a lot of students <laughs> compared to today. And it's the people who, who made this space, the, the individual who, who transformed this space. This is an older image of the Willa Cather Memorial Prairie just south of Red Club today. Um, who transformed this space through persistence, stubbornness in some cases, rebellion. Um, and she documented all of it. 
Okay? And she, she also actively kind of resisted a lot was going on. This is the other thing, too, to remember about her. You know, she's not buried in Red Cloud. She stopped coming back after a while when most of her family had passed on. Okay? Um, she had a very difficult relationship with her hometown and, and with Nebraska. Okay? And she also didn't always write about Nebraska. She also wrote about New Mexico, and she wrote about Virginia, and she wrote about Canada. She was starting to work, a, work on a novel about France when she passed away. Um, and it's with that, you know, this is, this is one of my, one of the, I think one of the best short stories, is, is Tommy the Unsentimental. Um, you know, in, in wanting to document the town eccentrics, the town rebels, that was Willa. Tommy the Unsentimental, which, which is about um, Tommy Theodosia, a very thinly veiled portrait of Willa. Um, she was just one of them. She played whist and billiards with them and made their cocktails for them, something to uh, take one herself occasionally. These are the, she's, she's making cocktails for the business leaders of Red Cloud. She's one of the guys. Um, indeed, Tommy's cocktails were things of fame in South Down, and the professional compounders of drinks always bowed respectfully to her as though acknowledging a powerful rival. She shaved her head when she was young. She signed letters as William. This is, this is one of the photos when she's got her buzz cut. Um, you know, she's, she's known around town as, as someone who's definitely pushing the envelope on a lot of things, okay? Leaning out the window of her bedroom, smoking a cigarette, and putting it out whenever somebody's coming up the stairs. Um, and so again, she wants to see people to be seen as they are, not who Victorian society, not who pioneer society wanted them to be. Um, and as we go through, and I'm, I've, I'm, again, I'm going to be making a plea to you to read more of her works. Um, you know, we see a lot of her thoughts about Nebraska. This is from O Pioneers, you know, kind of her, her first, it's her second novel, but she, cons she considers it her first novel. Um, Carl sat musing until the sun leaped above the prairie, and in the grass about him all the small creatures of the day began to tune their tiny instruments. Birds and insects without number began to chirp, to twitter, to snap and whistle, to make all manners of fresh shrill noises. The pasture was flooded with light. Every clump of ironweed and snow on, uh, snow on the mountain threw a long shadow, and the golden light seemed to be rippling through the curly grass like the tide racing in. The prairie is an ocean. And when you look at it, you can notice all of this. If you were to say, take somebody from out of town, take them down to the prairie, they'd be like, it's just grass. But no, she's pointing out the individual flowers, the waves, the sounds, everything. She's asking us to notice. She's asking us to take it as it is, not what we want it to be. And in the same, in A Lost Lady, which is about Silas Garber, the former governor, and his second wife, Lyra, who's, who's depicted here. This was the very end of the road making west. The men who'd put plains and mountains under the iron harness were old. Some were poor, and even the successful ones were hunting for rest and a brief reprieve from the death. It was already done, gone, that age. Nothing could ever bring it back. The taste and smell and song of it, the visions those men had seen in the air and followed, these that had caught in the kind of afterglow in their own faces, and this would always be his. The pioneer era was gone. The road builders were gone. The empire builders were gone. They were old men. It's not nostalgia for the prairie experience. It's a recognizing what's going on and seeing it as it is, that it's changing. Nebraska is changing. And then, as a carny, I, I do have to put this one in here. Uh, Lucy Gayhart's the only, the only novel set on the Platte River. It's still Red Cloud, but it's set on the Platte River. Um, there's no air like the Platte Valley. As Denver's too high and Chicago's too low, there are no autumns like ours anywhere. She knows it. She asks us to see it. Not as, it, not as we want it to be, but as it is. And so when she left us in New Hampshire, this is her tomb in Jaff Jaffrey, New Hampshire. She leaves us, actually. And this, this was shared earlier. It is happiness to be dissolved into something complete and great for my Antonia. And just as we close, I do, I do, no, I've, no one's mentioned her poetry, I want to leave you with her last poem. This is the last poem of the last collection. And this is, this is, I think, encompassing a lot of the particularities of being a Nebraskan and knowing Nebraska. How smoothly the trains ran or run beyond the Missouri. Even in my sleep, I know when I have crossed the river. 
The wheels turned as they were glad to go. The sharp curves and windings left behind. The roadway wide open. The crooked straight and the rough places plain. They run smoothly. They run softly too. There is not noise enough to, tr to trouble the lightest sleeper, nor jolting to wake the weary hearted. I open my window and let the air blow in. The air of morning, the smell of grass and earth, earth the grain giver. How smoothly the trains run beyond the Missouri. Even in my sleep, I know when I have crossed the river. The wheels turn as they were glad to go. They run like running water, like youth running away. They spin bright along the bright rails, singing and humming, singing and humming. They run remembering, they run rejoicing, as they too were going home. Thank you.